welcome to the class. I'm not sure if you noticed, but weather gods uh, said it's important to come to 246, so they gave us, I think, three hours of sunshine so that you can safely come to the classroom and leave the classroom, and then again, it will pour. I just checked on, on, on weather. So, great. Thank you, weather gods. Um, so, we are talking um, about graphs, and what I want to talk today about is um, some recent ideas. How can you, um, how can you think of taking graphs or taking nodes, nodes in the graph and uh, kind of computing coordinates of them so that you can then do various kinds of uh, tasks on top of, on top of those coordinates, right? So the idea is, imagine you, do, you wanna do a link prediction in a network, like friend recommendation, people you may know, um, and, and so on. Then the way you, could, you can formalize those tasks is to say, I have a social network of people and I wanna make predictions whether certain pairs of people are friends with each other or not. Right, and this would be called the link prediction task. We are given a, a network and we, we want to know for a certain pairs of um, nodes whether they are connected or not, right? And then we would make predictions and say, aha, uh -huh, we predicted this one correctly, we, we made a mistake there, and so on and so forth. So this is an example of a link prediction task in networks. And there are many applications in which link prediction tasks uh, can, be uh, can, be, can be formulated. You could even think of recommender systems as a link prediction between a user and an item. You can think of creating heterogeneous graphs of, I don't know, people or researchers, papers, conferences they publish at, and you could start asking, can I predict a link whether a given person is going to publish at a given conference, right? Um, or in um, kind of, um, um, in, uh, in um, um, biomedical applications, you can create this kind of heterogeneous networks of patients, diseases, uh, genes, drugs, and you can start asking various types of relationships or associations between different uh, objects. And the way you would formalize this, you would formalize it as a link prediction task. So this is first example. A second example of the task we'd like to be able to do is what is called node classification. Right, where the idea is, again, I'm given a network, nodes are labeled by colors, some of the nodes don't have a color, and I want to predict the color of the node. Um, what could the color mean? For example, if you, are a, if you are a telco, then you have this problem that people churn, meaning people leave your network. So could I predict what is the risk of a given person to leave my network, right? So to quit AT&T and go to Verizon. Could I, could I detect, based on their usage pattern, the structure of the call network, who's going to leave, right? That's churn prediction problem. Another thing you could do is you could say, oh, I'm doing a recommender system, but I'm doing it on top of the social network. And what would that mean is, you know, maybe uh, red means you like action movies and green means you like movies about the nature. Then you could say, aha, I have this person here, what kind of movies do they like? And based on the friends they, they have, that should tell me something about what kind of movies does this person like, right? So I would basically take this graph that is maybe partially labeled, and I would like to uh, label the rest of it. Another example of this is if you think this of, of a social network, some people tell you their age, gender, location, and you want to infer age, gender, location for everyone else. Why would you want to do this inference? Because maybe you can then do uh, recommender systems better. Maybe you want to use this because when you do ad targeting, an advertiser comes and says, I want to only um, uh, uh, target uh, women between 20 and 30 years old. So you need to be able to go into this graph and say, here is where the women are, right? And most of this graph is unlabeled, so you have to infer who's a woman, how old they are, so that then you can, let's say, show them ads or certain promotions or whatever you are doing, right? So this would be an example of a node classification task because for a given node, you have to figure out its label, whatever that uh, label is, right? Another example of node classification task is uh, what is called, for example, protein function prediction, where you can take a network of proteins. Proteins are molecules in our bodies that essentially regulate how life works, and they physically come work together for our cells, cells to be alive. And different uh, proteins have different functions. So the, you, and for certain proteins, we know their functions. We were able to experimentally validate it. Basically, some biologists spend, I don't know, half a year or a year in the lab and validates a function. There is about 20,000 proteins in human body. So that's 20,000 biologist years to do, to do all that, right? And I'm probably underestimating. So the question then becomes, 
could I develop machine learning tools that would allow me to say um, what is the function of a given protein and use this as a hypothesis so that biologists can go investigate that hypothesis maybe in half a year and not spend entire year or whatever, right? So um, this is an example of a node classification task. So what is, why is this hard and why is this interesting? The reason why this is hard and the reason why this is interesting, maybe I go back, is that what do you need to account for here? One thing you need to account is to say, I know nothing about this node, but let's say I have some labels, some colors of the nearby nodes. So I need to learn how to combine those labels of the nearby nodes. Another thing that is important is I need to know what is the pattern of connections, right? So for example, this node has this particular degree. These are its neighbors. They are connected in this kind of way, right? So if I want to be able to label uh, the node, so this node classification, I have to kind of capture the structure of the graph. I somehow have to be able to say what, how does the surrounding of a given neighbor look, given node look like so that I can make prediction then, right? So if you think about it, it is very hard to do this because you don't have good features. You have to generate good features. What do I mean by this is you can take your raw data, your raw network data, you generate a set of features of for every node so that later, do later down you could apply some learning algorithm, get some model and make some predictions. And the crucial part here that, that happens in every machine, machine learning task is that you have to do feature engineering. And the feature engineering for network data is so much more intense because you want to say, oh, I need to cap capture the structure of the, no the network, structure of the network around that node. So you could say, I will have one feature that tells me how many links the node has. Then I'll have the second um, uh, feature that will tell me um, how, how strong are these links. And then I'll have the third feature that will tell me whether the friends of a friend are connected with each other. And the fourth one that will be the page rank score of that node. And the fifth one will be the, the most, uh, the highest page rank score neighbor of that person. And you could create gazillions of these features and get lost. So the question becomes, um, you know, could we kind of get away from this feature engineering? Could I somehow automatically learn the structure of the network and, and be able to capture this topological structural property of the network around the node somehow automatically? That's the hope, that we can do that in a purely structural way. And the way we will do this is the topic of today's lecture, which is about how do I do what we will call task independent feature learning for graphs? Right, where the idea will be that I'm given a network and for every node in the network, I want to figure out some set of coordinates. Let's say I want to assign each node a D, D, D coordinate. So I will embed every node in a D dimensional space where D is provided by the user. Think of a few hundred or a few thousand. So, you know, maybe 4,000 dimensions, 100 dimensions, something of that sort. So still a relatively small, but quite big. Um, and I would like to figure out how to assign each node uh, a vector such that nodes that have similar network surroundings that and are close in the network have similar vectors, have similar embeddings, have similar representations. So the idea will be that this vector representation will capture the structure of the no of the network around the node. That's that's kind of intuitively what we would like to do. Right? And this will be super cool because we don't have to now create these manual descriptors that say, oh, this node has degree one, and then you know the na its neighbor has degree two, and you know the two neighbors are then connected with each other, but here this guy has degree one, and then it's three, but then two of its neighbors are connected, but not the, the, the third pair is not, and, and so on and so forth. Right? So we would just like to do this in some sense automatically, and today we'll talk about how to do that, right? So our goal will be to take every node and map it into a point uh, in a low dimensional uh, space. Um, and the idea will be, right, that we call it the distributed representation because the idea is that this representation captures similarities between nodes, right? That nodes that are in the same part of the space are somehow, have somehow similar network around them. Um, and the idea is that similarity of the embedding uh, of the nodes indicates the similarity of their networks. However, we will define that, right? 
Um, and uh, this will encode network uh, information and, and, in, and kind of generate the representation for the node. So the idea is that I'll take my network, I can think of it as an adjacency matrix, right? Number of nodes, number of nodes, and there is a dot if particular pair of nodes is connected. And out of this, I can embed every node into this d dimensional space that is much smaller than the number of vertices, right? So you could think that even you could take your adjacency matrix and you'd say, oh, wh what this really is is every node here is every node, every row is, is an embedding. It's a binary embedding, right? In principle, every node is, is represented, if I have n nodes, each node is represented by n 0, 1 coordinates. That's a silly embedding, but it is an embedding. What we would like to do is come up with coordinates with d coordinates per node where d is much less than the number of nodes in the network and be able to kind of allow us to compare these coordinates and it will allow us to compare the structures, uh, the structure of the nodes neighborhood in the network. And once I have these coordinates, I can do anything I like. I can do clustering, I can do anomaly detection, I can do attribute prediction, node classification, I can do link prediction, anything you like, right? I could run SVD on top of this, I can uh, run hierarchical clustering or k-means on top of this. Um, I could run LSH on top of this. I can do anything I like, right? Like everything that we talked about, how do you deal with high dimensional data in let's say Euclidean space, cosine similarity and so on, I could just apply here and life would be good, okay? So that's why this is kind of so cool. And the way we'll think of this is that it doesn't really matter what the task is, if we do a good job here, all these tasks will work well. That's the, that's the exciting part. Um, are there uh, any questions about this idea? Any thoughts? How do you validate like? Great, how, how do you validate? validate? The way you validate these things is that you say, I will take my network, I will learn these things, and then here you can define some prediction task and say, how good is this at that prediction task? Um, we, you will see, I will, I will give you a definition of what exactly is the optimization problem that you compute this. And then of course you can then evaluate it on some downstream task. But the hope is if this kind of captures the network structure, then this will be a good representation regardless of what is the downstream task. It will be kind of non-specialized good representation. It may not be the best representation for the task, but it will be a good representation for the task. And of course you could further specialize it if you, if you really say, I only care about this task and not in general. Uh, what's the heuristics of picking up a D? What would be a right way of uh, saying, okay, what's What is a now? good heuristic for D? Usually we think of D to be in hundreds. It depends on the network, depends on the size of the data. Uh, for example, when we take, uh, last time I was t talking to you about the, 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 um, the Pinterest graph and the Pinterest recommender system. Uh, in Pinterest, this D is actually quite, we started with about 1000, right now it's 256 for 3 billion nodes and 20 billion edges, right? So this is relatively small, right? If this matrix is 3 billion by 3 billion, this is 3 billion by 256, right? So, 256 is relatively small, but you want to make it small because you want, you want it to be efficient. We experimented with bigger first, but then we figured out that actually small works as well. So we were happy. Yes? Given the latent, given the latent matrix, is it possible to recover the adjacent D matrix? Great question. So the question is, right, we want to go this way. The question is, do we, can we recover it? So in some sense, the answer is yes. And the, the trick, how do we train, how do we do these embeddings is this notion of self supervision, where you kind of can train the model without any, lab, with, without any labels, but kind of you, 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 the model supervises itself, right? So in some sense, the way we will create self supervision is to say, can I recover this matrix from those, uh, from these coordinates? That's the optimization problem we'll be solving. That's a good point. Yes. So just designing these kind of task independent features and then doing whatever task is on top of that, um, outperform trying to design some kind of end-to-end -end learning for a specific task. Great. The question is, do you want to do this still here and then apply or if you do end-to-end? End-to-end -end will be better, right? Because you can super specialize it. 
what, what I will show you is something that, that works well across the tasks, but it's not specialized, right? The problem is if you want to do end to end, you need labels here. But if you don't have enough labels, then maybe you want to do this first and then only specialize here, right? It's the same argument that in, in text you do word to vec, right? Word to vec is also not specialized. It's just a good embedding that you can do for any kind of task. Right, so essentially what this will be, the method I'll talk about is essentially extension of word to vec to graphs for those who, who know what I'm talking about. All right, great. So how would this look like? Here is an example. Um, this is a, a social network of people um, um, uh, joining a karate club at uh, some university in around 1950s. Um, and what was interesting about this network, this network is called Zachary's Karate Club Network. These are people who were part of one karate club. And then there was a, a quarrel between an influential person. This is this node and the instructor, that node, and the, the karate club split into two. And what was interesting is that split happened, I think, like, uh, actually, no, split happened here and kind of can be beautifully explained by the structure of the network. So this is the, the first case where it was really shown that the social network matters when, you know, who will join the, the, the influential person versus who goes with the old instructor as, as this breakup happened. But the point here is that if you are given this network uncolored, just nodes and edges on the input, if you would say let's create these coordinates, here would be our set of coordinates. And I just added colors so that uh, you can easily map the nodes. And every node has an ID and every node matches here, right? And what is interesting is that for this small network of 34 nodes, you see how the coordinates kind of correspond to the structure and location of the node, right? Like the green nodes are down here, but then 26 and 25 are these two nodes. And then, you know, the violet uh, from there are here. And then the red are kind of in the center, in the middle. And then the top right are the, the cyan nodes, right? So you see how kind of these coordinates tell us how similar are, are, uh, are the nodes, right? Um, and uh, um, kind of reveal the structure of the network in this two-dimensional space. Uh, we won't embed in two dimensions, but we'll embed in multiple dimensions. Um, why is this training these embeddings hard? One reason why this is hard is because um, kind of the modern deep learning toolbox is specialized to work with simple data types, right? We know how to work with si fixed size grids, right? We can take images, we can resize them, they're all the same size. So we know how to work with grid graphs. And we also know how to work with chain graphs, right? If you think about text and speech, that has a linear structure. So I can define some notion of a sliding window and I know where in this where am I on this, uh, um, on this uh, sequence? Or if I think of images, again, I can define some notion of a window. And again, I have some notion of locality. I know where the top left corner is. I know where the bottom right corner is. Things are easy. I kind of know where I am in the network. If you think about the graphs, graphs, real world graphs, natural graphs look like this. There is no sense of direction. There is no sense of what's up, what's down. Um, the structure is more, more compli complex. I don't even know how to resize a graph. I know how to resize an image. I don't know how to resize a graph. Another thing that's interesting is that graphs are, are isomorphic. What does that mean is I can take this graph, renumber or renumber the nodes, and the graph will look different, but it's still topologically the same structure. What that corresponds to is essentially that I can uh, swap um, uh, rows and columns of the adjacency matrix, and that's still the same structure. While if you take an image and reshuffle the rows and columns, it's a different image. So you have a lot of very interesting challenges when you try to kind of go and take these simple data types and generalize methods that were developed here because it's kind of much easier to see what happens in this more complex and in some sense much more general case, right? So this is what we will try to do is in some sense thinking how do methods from, from here generalize to this more complex, more interesting. Uh, case. So let me now start telling you about how are we going to do this and how are we going to think about it. So here is how we'll think. We'll say we have a graph and uh, the graph will have a set of vertices. Um, and let's say A will be our adjacency matrix. And for now, let's assume binary and let's assume uh, undirected edges, even though everything will work for directed edges as well. 
And for now, let's assume that nodes have no features. Nodes, ha nodes have no attributes. All I care about is capturing the structure of the network, okay? So here is our goal. Our goal will be to encode nodes s um, into some low dimensional sp space. So basically map them into some low dimensional space such that the positions, the similarities, the distances in this low dimensional space will be, will, will correspond to the similarities in the original space, right? So the idea is I'm given this original network, undirected, just nodes, and I wanna learn this function, we'll call it encoder function, that takes the node and maps it into some vector z in this embedding space. And the idea is that nodes that are similar in this network map close together in this embedding space. That's what we would like to achieve. So now you have a question or just exercising? <laughs> just exercising, okay. So um, uh, this, is, this is the goal uh, that we will, we will uh, of what we will try to do. So um, now maybe if I go back, there are two things to notice here. We say similarity in the embedding space approximates similarity in the original network. So there is kind of two things to define. One, i what, one is what is similarity in the embedding space? What is our similarity metric here? And then the, the other thing we have to define is what is our similarity here, right? So there are kind of two similarities to define. So let's first define the similarity in the, um, in the embedding space, right? So we will say that similarity of U and V in the original network has to approximate the similarity in the embedding space, um, right up here, right? So how do I define similarity in the embedding space? Let's say I will define similarity by dot product, okay? So by the dot product of the two vectors, okay? I could, in some sense, what I choose as similarity up here um, doesn't matter that much. What will matter more is how do I define similarity here, right? This is some metric in this embedding space and however we define this metric, then the embedding might be a bit different. But the point is that whatever is the similarity in the network uh, respects the similarity in the embedding space, right? Now, of course, what we need to define is similarity in the network and how do we learn what is the structure of this function, this encoding function that takes the node and gives out spits out the coordinates, okay? So um, let's now keep making progress. So the, there are few things we need to define. We need to define this encoder function that takes the node and gives me the coordinates. We need to define a node similarity function that tells me how similar are two nodes in the network. How similar is the structure of the network around these two nodes? And then we wanna optimize parameters of this encoder function such that the similarity in the original network is approx approximates as closely as possible the similarity in the embedding space, right? So there is a, a, an encoder function here that creates these coordinates and I wanna optimize this encoder function here that creates the coordinates so that these similarities equal those similarities, right? That's, that's kind of the game, the game we wanna play, yes? Normalize somehow the z vectors so that like a really large z vector wouldn't overpower like dissimilar vectors. Uh, the question is, do we normalize z vectors? You can, but it's not clear why. Right? This is still a very well defined task. You don't have to, because the point is just you want to take the similarities and overfeed them to those similarities, right? So what this means is that, of course, here if you would embed this in a 100,000 dimensional space, then you can kind of make it a very easy thing. But if you make this a uh, low dimensional space, 256 with 3 billion nodes, then, then it will kind of force you to, 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 to be very strategic how you assign coordinates. So that's in some sense what you do. And don't necessarily do uh, what, you, what you suggested, which would be kind of keep the vector small, which is what we did in recommender systems. So here, the dimensionality is how you force the model to actually try to learn something. But a good point, actually. All right, good. So these are the three things we need to do. So there are two, two key components. First is this notion of an encoder that uh, maps each node to a low dimensional vector. Right, so the idea is that the encoder takes the identity of the node and, and outputs the d-dimensional embedding z of that node v, okay? 
And then the second important component is the similarity function that specifies how relationship in the vector space map to the relationships in the original network, right? So similarity of U and V in the network is approximate, it can be approximated by the dot product or the similarity between the, co the assigned coordinates by the encoder of the two nodes. Okay, so um, now wh how, wh what would be a simplest type of encoder we could come up with? The simplest type of encoder you can come up with is shown here where Z is a matrix and V is a, what is called a one hot encoding of the node. So let me explain, right? So Z will be our parameters, right? Z is a matrix of D dimensions times number of nodes. So essentially this says for, for every node, we want to learn D coordinates. And this will be the, this huge matrix or huge matrix that way, okay? And then node V, will be a vector uh, of length number of nodes. Um, and this vector is what is called one hot vector or an indicator vector that will have all zero except one single one in the column indicating the node V. Okay, so I can r number the nodes from one to, uh, to uh, V. And then uh, if I have node number seven, I'll have all zeros only a value one at coordinate seven. So this is this indicator vector, okay? So now how does our encoder work? Um, here is basically what our encoder is. We will call this, uh, this, this matrix Z the embedding matrix. And essentially our encoder is just an embedding lookup, right? If you think, if I go back, if you think what Z times V does, essentially it selects the width column out of this matrix. So essentially every node has, is a column here and Z times V just selects a given column, right? So essentially what this means, we will have one column per node. So we have columns as many as the nodes and we have rows as many as what is the dimensionality or the size of the embedding. So if you think about what is the uh, number of parameters we wanna estimate, the number of parameters we wanna estimate is this matrix Z, right? It is uh, D parameters per node, okay? Um, and then, you know, once I have that, I can multiply it with this indicator vector and this is my encoder function, right? It will return just the, the width column that represents the embedding of the node uh, V. And that's, uh, and that's it. So it's, we call it shallow encoder because it's just a table lookup. Essentially it's a matrix lookup that takes out uh, the appropriate column. Yes? What's the uh, one hot? Uh-huh. What is one hot? Indicator vector is one hot. It's just a technical term to say it's a vector that has all zeros except a value of one at whatever is the index of this node. All right, good question. Great, thank you. Super, so moving on. So, um, right, so this is the simplest possible encoder because the encoder is just a embedding uh, lookup, it's just a table lookup. Um, and you know, each node is assigned a unique embedding vector because each node has a set of parameters, the entire column reserved for itself. And there are many methods that, that do this. We'll talk about two today. We'll talk about one that's called deep walk. And then we'll talk an about another one that's called node to vec. Those are uh, the two things, okay? So um, now what is really the, the, the important part is how do we define no sim node similarity? Right? How should you say how, how similar are two nodes in the network, right? You could say, are the two nodes connected? Do they share neighbors? Do they have friends in common? Do they have similar structural roles, right? Do, does the network locally look similar to, to who they are? This idea of structural roles is, some, is, is in a sense that, you know, I don't know in a company you may have bosses and admins and workers and a social network of the worker or is a different than of the admin versus the boss. And you know, the boss may talk to the admins and admins talk to the workers. And you know, you could think about that your network kind of shows how your, uh, what your role in organization is. Or a, you know, a network of, uh, of interactions of a professor versus a student versus an admin at the university. Again, those networks look different, right? So that's the, that's the idea. So what we will do is I'll show you random walk approaches to embeddings, right? So in some sense, it seems that the theme of our investigation of, uh, of uh, graphs 
one way or another, you know, there are random walks that, that always pop up. So here, random walks will pop up as well. So let's see how we can do this. These are the two papers. One is from 2014, one is from 2016. So this is kind of really um, recent stuff, okay? So here is the idea. How do, how do we define node similarity? We say that the dot product between the embeddings on node u and v approximates the, the probability that u and v co-occur in a random walk over the network, right? So the idea is that um, if I have a random walk in the network and the random walker visits nodes u and v close together in its walk, like in they are in close proximity to one another in the, in the walk, in the sequence of steps that it takes, then those two nodes are more similar to each other, so we should embed them closer to one another. Right, so the idea is that the random walker walks and it essentially creates a sequence of uh, node IDs that, that it visited. And the more often U and V co-appear together in this sequence close to one another, the more similar they are. That's the, that's the idea, okay? I have uh, this explained a bit more, right? So the idea is that we want to estimate, and, and this is where random walks come from, right? It's a random walker walking uh, over the, over the network. So the idea is that I want to estimate the probability of visiting a node V on a random walk starting from node U. And we will say using some random walk strategy R because this random walker can be kind of page rank unbiased random walker, but can be, you know, a random walker that is using some weird uh, way how to trans how to transfer the network. And our goal is right to say how likely if I start the walk at node u, how likely am I to visit uh, node v? That's the idea, right? So this is how do I think of random walks and co-visitation. And then I can think about optimizing embeddings so that they encode these random walk statistics from step one, right? So that similarity dot product uh, encodes the random walk similarity, where we say how likely am I to visit node v if I start the random walk from node, from node u? And again, dot product is simply the cosine of the angle between the two, between the two nodes, right? So, so if they are orthogonal, then the similarity is zero. And if they kind of over, they, if, they, if the angle is very small, then the similarity is large, okay? So that's, that, is the, that, is, uh, that is the idea. So now, the question is why random walks? Why, why not something else? And the reason why random walks is that random walks are extremely flexible, stochastic, and we can define, and they, can, they allow us to define node similarity that incorporates both kind of local and higher order or more global network, uh, network similarity information, right? It really, they allow you to, to, to really s capture what is very close around the starting node and also how the network looks farther away. So that's one in terms of that they are the good thing. And then the second thing is that they are amazingly computationally efficient, right? We don't need to consider all node pairs and how similar they are when training, but we only need to consider pairs that co-occur on a random walk, right? So if I go back and I do my random walks starting from this node and I only explore the network locally, I, don't, I will probably never need to consider the top left node and this particular node because the random walk will never visit them. Right? So kind of computations are nicely local. That's another good thing about random walks. They only explore the network locally rather than need to consider all, all pairs of nodes when I, when I, um, uh, when I train uh, these embeddings, okay? So this is quite an important point, right? Um, and similar to what we had last time. Okay, so this is the reason why we want to do this. So now, um, a bit of intuition, and then I'll give you the formal um, uh, specification of the, of the optimization problem, and we'll talk a bit how do we solve it efficiently, right? So the intuition is that I want to find embedding of node in the dimensional space so that node similarity in the network is preserved. The idea is that I want to learn node embedding such that nearby nodes are close to get, uh, nearby nodes in the embedding are close together in the network. So given a node U, how do we define nearby? We will define this notion of a neighborhood. We will say, let n of u be a neighborhood of node u obtained by some strategy r, okay? So uh, r is unspecified, but the idea is I take a node u and I say, how does the network, would, ne network neighborhood of u look like? Who is in the network neighborhood, okay? 
And here is now what do we want to do? We want to do this embedding, embedding estimation as an optimization problem. So we will say we are given a graph. Um, our goal is to map every node in the graph in the d dimensional space. And uh, we want to optimize the following equation. So what does this say? It says the following. It says maximize the coordinates, find the coordinates of the nodes, such that if you go over all the nodes in the network, from the coordinates of the node, you can predict which nodes are nearby. Right? This is, uh, this is the neighborhood of node u. So I'm saying from the coordinates of node u, predict who's in the neighborhood of u. Right? So I came up with a prediction problem where I don't need any labels. What I need to do is for every node, I need to define the neighborhood, some set of nodes. Maybe these are direct neighbors. Maybe these are neighbors I s or some nodes that I somehow selected from the network. And now I want to fix the coordinates, right? I want to solve for the coordinate z such that from the coordinates, I can guess or predict who the, who the neighbors are, who's in the neighborhood, right? So this n sub bar is n uh, right now abstractly defined notion of a neighborhood of node u. Right, so now given node u, we want to uh, estimate the feature representation predictive of the nodes in its neighborhood n of u. And if we solve this, then we came up with coordinates. And these coordinates will put similar nodes that are neighbors of one another close together. That's the, that's the idea. Okay, so now how do we define the neighborhood? In, when I define the neighborhood, I don't want to just look at the immediate neighbors, but I want to expand my view of the network a bit. So here is how uh, the original paper called Deep Walk proposes to do this. They say, take a starting node u and run short fixed length random walks from the starting node uh, um, in the graph, right? Some random walk strategy R, right? So the idea would be I pick a node u and I say, I will, walk, I will run 100 random walks of seven steps from this node. And I run a random walk of seven steps and I record uh, the identities of the nodes I visit in these seven steps. And this would create, give me, if I repeat this process 100 times, it would give me 100 different neighborhood sets and for that starting node u. Okay? And these are now my neighborhood sets. And I can generate, let's say, 100 for each node. Um, and uh, the, no the size of the neighborhood set, let's say, is 7 because my random walks take 7 steps before I stop and uh, restart. Okay? So the idea is that now, right, each node will collect this uh, um, neighborhood set n. These are the nodes visited on the random walk starting from node u. And now, right, our goal is to, uh, to uh, optimize embedding such that given the node u, we are able to predict what are the neighbor, who is in the neighborhood of that, of that node. And just what do I do? Why do I have summation and the log, right? This is now probability. Uh, how well can I predict the neighborhood of a given node u? But I have all the nodes, so I want to multiply these probabilities. Um, but I don't multiply probabilities because numerically you never want to multiply probabilities. You always want to take the log. If you take the log, the product becomes a sum, right? And then that's why I say a sum over log probabilities over all the nodes in the network. Um, and um, Right? And uh, um, this is all, all, all to think about. The neighborhood can have repeated elements, can have repeated nodes, because uh, a node can be visited multiple times in the, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the walk. And the last thing I, I say is you always want to work, when you implement any kind of probabilistic model, you always want to work with log probabilities, because probabilities are small, and if you multiply them, uh, numerical errors kill you very quickly. But uh, if you take the log, then small numbers are not so small anymore, and summations are much more robust. So just kind of for numerical reasons, you never want to work with the raw probabilities. You, wanna, you always want to work with log probabilities, okay? So this is what we said so far. What we still need to do is unpack this equation. Uh, but at least at high level, things should be clear, yes? Any questions? Oh, you have, yeah, go ahead. Why, do you, why is it numerically always better to work with log probabilities? Because if you have 0. 0.000001, if you, if you take a log of that, you know, it will be minus 6 or whatever, right? 
And then when you multiply these small probabilities, you'll, these exponents will just sh keep expanding. And, and if you know how the float numbers are encoded as bits, there is only a fixed number of uh, uh, fixed precision to them. But if you take the log, then you are working with numbers plus five, minus seven, whatever, and adding things up, you don't lose anything. All right? Um, yeah, there is really good reasons why you want to do that. Great. Great, exactly. How do you do this? This is what we are going to say, right? How do I say what's the probability of a multiset given the embedding? This sounds very like it's not clear what how how you would really go do this. So we have to unpack it. Okay. So actually, my next step unpacks it, right? So here is the assumption, right? Like I'm really saying, what's the probability of a set given the coordinates of the nodes, of the node? And, and this, like working with this like high dimensional combinatorial object like a multiset is very hard. So what do you do? Usually you have to make some independence assumption. So the independence assumption we will make will say that conditional likelihood factorizes over the set of neighbors. So what I'll say is that the log probability of a set of neighbors given the coordinates um, will be the, basically I'm saying that neighbors are conditionally independent from one another. So I will make an assumption that this probability can be expressed in the following way, where I say, aha, uh -huh, the, the total log probability is simply a sum of log probabilities that for a given node, this given node V who is in the neighborhood is a, is a, is a, um, is a neighbor. Okay? So um, now, this is much easier to do because it's just a sum of whoever is in the neighborhood. And if this is a multiset, again, it's just a sum. So this is quite easy. Okay, so now I'm saying I'm sum, uh, so to estimate the log probability of a multiset given the node, I'm saying this is simply a sum over the element of that multiset probability of that, um, um, uh, basically the, the probability of node V given the embedding of node U. Now I still have to ask, ask, explain what is this, pr um, this probability here. And the way you, you do it is written down here, and this is called the soft max parameterization. I will explain why is it called this way, but I say probability of node V given node U is simply uh, their dot product exponentiated divided by the sum over all the nodes in the network. Um, um, and then here I'm going over all the nodes, and then their dot product with the node u and ex exponentiated. So that this is essentially a normalizing factor so that if I sum up this probability over, over, uh, over v, I get, I get one, right? So this is a normalizing factor and this is how I do it. The reason why this is called a softmax is because I want node v to be most similar to the, to the node u because it's in the neighborhood. Right? And the intuition is that some of the exponents is the same as the maximum of the exponent, right? So if I have a sum over i exponent of xi, that will be kind of similar to, uh, will give me the similar value if I say, what's the largest uh, xi and I exponentiate it, right? So the idea is that I want to find the maxima, the largest element. And one way how I can find the largest element is that I exponentiate the elements and sum it up. Because when I exponentiate, the biggest guy will get so much bigger that will overshadow everyone else, right? So this is like a maximum, but it's like a soft version of it. So that's why this is called soft max. Um, so intuition should be fine. Um, this is how we do it. We have this normalizing factor here that is a bit tricky because we have to sum over all other nodes in the network, right? We have to say, what is the similarity between nodes u and v? And then we have to divide this by the sum of the similarities between node u and any other node in the network. Yes? How do we handle the repeat elements in the multi-set? Uh, uh, why wouldn't you know how to handle them? Like what happens if they have, uh, occur multiple times in the multi-set? Yes, this is why uh, they can occur, like I don't, like who cares? Like I have a summation, uh, if, this, if there are multi, if the same element, um, a same node x appear here seven times, I will sum it up seven times together. I mean, it's just a summation over some nodes. Who cares whether nodes appear multiple times or only once? 
right? It should, we should know, we know how to sum. So it should be fine, right? I mean, you may be confused, but there's nothing to be confused about, right? I have some sequence of stuff and I sum over that sequence. What do I care what's in the sequence? Oh yes, that's a typo, sorry, this is NR, yes, good question, sorry, uh, I should fix that. Um, yeah, I think in the original paper it was used S and then I somehow decided maybe not too wisely to rename that to R. All right, good, good catch, thank you. Um, right, so that's just the neighborhood set of a given node. Great, so let's now uh, put it all together. So how does our overall optimization problem look like? If you say, let's sum over all the nodes for every node Let's sum up over all the neighbors, and then we have this uh, log of the soft max, right? Where now I'm saying the following: I say sum over all the nodes, sum sum over all the neighbors of that node u v, and then I say what is the soft max between the embedding of u, embedding of v, and then I have this uh, normalizing factor, right? Uh, so what this means is that. If I solve this optimization problem, right? So if I optimize the random box embeddings, then I'm basically saying I'm finding the coordinates z of the nodes such that I minimize this function l, right? This is in some sense my, my loss function. It tells me how well can I predict the neighbors given the coordinates of the nodes, right? The better I can predict the neighbors, the, the smaller this loss function will be, right? Because here I have the softmax, so um, the, um, the, better, uh, the better this thing will be. So the smaller the total value will be. Why smaller? Because I have a minus there, right? So um, that's, that's the idea. So now there is one thing that we should all notice is that this is quite expensive to do. And the reason why this is expensive to do, because I have nested summation over the nodes, right? I have to sum over the nodes once. And then for every node, I have to sum over all the other nodes again to compute the normalizing factor, right? So the, this algorithm, com just computing L once, takes quadratic time in the size of the network. And now I would want to apply some stochastic gradient descent type method over this coordinate z. So this would mean I would have to, for every step, I would have to do this quadratic computation of a gradient descent method. Right, so this would be amazingly slow. So what I want to say is I have the same equation is that cr solving this optimization problem naively, basically taking the gradients with respect to z and, uh, and skiing down the slope as we did in um, uh, uh, um, uh, using stochastic gradients or mini batch stochastic gradients or whatever you want, right? Um, will be expensive because the, I have a nested summation. So this summation takes quadratic time in the size of the network, which is prohibitively expensive. So here is what we will do. What we will do is we will try to, to get rid of this normalization term. We will try to approximate this normalization term, right? The idea will be that if we can compute this normalization term not in the linear time, but in constant time, time that is independent of the size of the network, then uh, our algorithm just became from quadratic, it became linear, right? And that's a ma major win for us. So the question is, how could I approximate that thing up there? And the solution to this, it's called negative sampling, okay? So the idea is kind of the following. The idea is that we will take this, um, uh, 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 this summation, and, and we will, um, we will do the following. We'll take, um, we will take the, we will uh, distribute the log inside and I'll have a log of the, the, the numerator and the log of the denominator. And then um, what I will also do is um, I will, as I do the, as I, as I take the logs, rather than taking the x up there, I will use the, I will use a, uh, a sigmoid function here. So I will replace the exponential with the sigmoid. And uh, also at the, um, in the, uh, here at the bottom, I'm taking the summation um, and I'm again replacing the x with a sigmoid function and I uh, distribute the log, the log inside. 
right? If I now think of how do I compute this, this thing is easy to compute. It's u and v, and I just do the dot product and it's fine. But what is interesting is that this thing here, rather than summing over all the nodes, I will say I will approximate it by summing over some random set of nodes that I, that I sample from the, from the distribution of nodes, okay? So the idea is essentially that this summation here, I will approximate it, approximate it by using some set of random nodes that I will sample, and uh, rather than computing this over all the nodes, I will sample over the, um, um, some subset of nodes, right? So the idea is instead of normalizing with respect to all nodes, I will um, normalize against k random nodes, and these k random nodes, nodes are called negative samples. This is why this is called negative sampling um, strategy. Yes? Do we want the negative samples to be outside of the neighborhood so that we're minimizing the probability that? Great, good question. Do we want, do we want uh, um, uh, uh, neighbor, uh, negative samples to be outside the neighborhood? Um, if you think here, this is a sum over all the nodes. So it's the nodes in the neighborhood plus nodes that are not in the neighborhood, right? So I think what, I, huh. Because, like, it's a good question. What do you want to do? What do you want to do in practice? Um, it's a good question. So, what usually I think people do is these negative samples, because you are just thinking of this as an approximation of that, you would just take a random set and you wouldn't even worry about, right? Be and again, the point is usually these um, neighborhoods are so small with respect to the, the rest of the graph that these are really nodes that are outside the neighborhood. All right, good point. All right, but uh, you don't even check. You just do it and it doesn't matter, okay? And uh, there are good reasons why you want to do this, and I describe them here, and there's a paper, and you can read more why this is a good way of doing it. Yes? Sorry? Is there a heuristic to choose K? Um, huh, the, the bigger the K, the more, the better in some sense the approximation. Uh, the value of k will also depend on the size, on the, um, in some sense, how big neighborhoods you, you, you are creating. Um, generally, I don't know, a good rule of a thumb is maybe 10x, 100x, depends how much can you afford. I don't think you have to select another k, or can you select k at the beginning and then just always use those nodes? Uh, good question. Uh, huh. I, the best thing would be if you could repeat that, if you could resample the nodes as you go along, right? What do you want to do in practice? Maybe you don't want to resample every step, but you would resample every so often. All right? Good. Thank you for this question. This is actually great. So uh, this is what we had, uh, what we had so far, and now of course here we say take a random sample of the nodes. What turns out to be important to work really well is that you take k negative uh, nodes, but the, you, you pick them proportional to the degree they have in the network. So that nodes with lots of edges that have lots of degree, they get picked more often. And the reason why, why this is good is because this is, this is good because um, the random walk walks over the nodes with higher de high degree more often than the nodes of low degree. So if you do it this way, then you kind of no normalize for the, uh, for the random walk. And as I mentioned, you guys were asking me, how do you pick k? You have two, co two, two options. One is a higher k gives you more robust estimates, but higher k corresponds to higher kind of prior or negative events, right? That this summation here will be bigger and bigger. So what people do in practice, if neighborhoods are of, let's say, size 5, then, uh, or, or even less, then people would do k, k between, let's say, 5 and 20, where 5 is super low and 20 is more what people like to choose, right? So k, number of negative samples to be around 20 is a good, is a good ballpark, ballpark number. The important thing is we want to sample them proportional to the degree, okay? Um, this is what I wanted to say. So let me summarize the method. Um, and, uh, and then we can kind of talk about extensions, right? So the idea is the following. For every node u, 
I will run, execute short fixed length, fixed length random walks, and I will count, I will memorize which nodes do I visit. And I will run these random walks for the same node multiple times. And out of this, I will create this multiset or multisets of neighbors. We'll call it the neighborhood. Now that I have this neighborhood n sub bar, then I will optimize embeddings using stochastic gradient descent, where essentially I'm trying to minimize this equation L, where um, I'm summing over the nodes, I'm summing over the neighborhood of a given node, and then I'm trying to, to, um, to, make, to, uh, uh, to optimize this log probability, where given the coordinates of node u, I want to predict whether node v is in the neighborhood, right? Um, and uh, this probability we approximate using negative sampling. Um, and what are we trying to solve for here? We try to solve for, for this coordinate z, okay? Um, and, and that's the method. And this method is called deep walk. And uh, if you think for people who have taken more deep learning classes, the way you can think of this is that essentially this is, a ve this is very much analogous to word to vec, right? What are we really doing here? What we are doing is that in word to vec you have this sliding window over the, over the documents and the idea is that for every word you want to find an embedding so that when you are given the word, you can predict which other word is nearby to it, right? So it's very similar. Given the word, predict who is, who is close to it. But on, on, the gra on the text it's easy because you have this sliding window and, you s and that defines the neighborhood. So what we are doing here with the random walk, in some sense we are taking the graph and we are linearizing it, right? We create this notion of the neighborhood of a window using the random walk. So in some sense we take the, we take the graph, we create sentences out of it, and then we can almost do something like word to vec. That's what, that's kind of philosophically what we are, what we are doing, right? We take a graph, run the random walk, random walk gives me now a sentence, a sequence of words, a sequence of nodes, and then I, I, I try to predict what the sentence is given the, given let's say the first guy, the first word in the, in the, in the sentence. Uh, that's one way to think of it. So it's uh, very kind of related and, and similar and in some sense, um, uh, yeah, related to how word to vec for embedding of words works. All right, great, yes. In word to vec actually there is a concept that you can actually have a set, you can have embeddings for the center word and you have embeddings for the neighboring words. Yeah. So, can, can you apply something similar here saying, okay, we know the node we are kind of starting out the random work with and we are seeing the neighborhood. Great. Yeah, good point. So, so yes, you can make these things fancier, right? You could say that embedding, this embedding should be different than that embedding. So every node maybe should have two embeddings, whether they are the, the center of the set or whether they are in the context of that set, right? You have your neighborhood embedding and your, um, your own embedding. That is, that is different. So you could do things like that. Yes, these are kind of natural extensions and, and these things have been extended in 700 different ways, right? But the, basic, the base idea is here. And yes, you could have multiple embedding, a different embedding when u is here versus when u is here, right? That's easy to do, natural idea. All right, yeah, good point. Super, anything more? Yes. Why can you replace the, when, when you're doing the negative sampling, why can you replace the exponential with the state point function? Uh -huh. <laughs> Good question. Why did I do that? Um, there are, let's just say that there are good theoretical reasons beyond the scope of this class to do so. Um, I, uh, I, I gave, because people ask this, I gave you a link to the paper and I'm happy to discuss it more kind of offline. All right, good. Yes. Yes, why do we uh, sample proportional to the degree? One thing why we would uh, sample proportional to the degree is that in the random walk, nodes with high degree are more likely to be visited, right? So this means that the node that has high degree will appear more often in the neighborhoods than nodes with low degrees. So we want to kind of upsample those high degree nodes also as negative samples. Otherwise, the, 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 the kind of the distribution, the distributions don't, between numerator and denominator don't match. Okay? Last question. Do we have to do any sort of 
renormalization for the negative sampling? Because we only take k samples. You can, you could do the, so the question is do you need to do any renormalization? You could, but it doesn't really matter because, yeah, it doesn't really matter. All right, let me continue. So um, what I wanted to do now is talk about extension where you can say, like I said, oh, you have a random walk strategy R. And so far we said, let's just use a normal kind of uh, random surfer type model. But um, the question is, what if you have uh, this random walk to be a bit smarter, right? And uh, the, 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 the algorithm I talked to you about right now, it's called deep walk, which is just basically says run fixed length unbiased random walks from its starting node u. But you could have weights on the edges or something like that. And uh, the question becomes, could you use some kind of biased random walks? So here is one idea. So this is now extension of this basic node um, deep walk. The method is called node to vec. And the idea is that, again, I want to embed nodes with similar network neighborhoods close in the feature space. I want to frame this goal as a prediction task of uh, kind of independent maximum likelihood optimization problems, as we saw before. Um, and the key observation will be to say, let's make the notion of the network neighborhood N of node U um, uh, to be more flexible because it can lead to different types of embeddings. And the idea will be that we'll generalize this first order ran unbiased random walk into something that is called a second order random walk and we'll label it with R so that we have more flexibility in how do we, gen um, how do we define this, um, uh, this neighborhood N of a given node U, right? So now we'll be using different types of random walks. So, this, so that's why I have that subscript R. Uh, there. That's the idea. So let me now give you an example. So the idea is that I want to have biased random walks. And the idea is that biased random walks can trade off between kind of the local and the global view of the network. If you think about it, if this is my starting node, I would really want, I could say, oh, I really care about understanding to a very fine degree how does the local structure around the node U looks like. And this maybe means that maybe I want to define as my neighborhoods no nodes S1, S2, and S3, where, where in kind of in the, in contrast, I could say, oh, what I really care about is to understand kind of network at bigger, more global uh, scale. And then maybe the neighborhood I would want to define would be S4, S5, S6, right? So this is a neighborhood of size 3, and this is a neighborhood of size 3. And, you know, these are kind of two extreme ways to define the neighborhood, but maybe I would want to kind of even interp interpolate between the two, right? And the first one, it's almost like a breadth first search. And the second one is more like a depth first search when I want to go as far away from the node U as possible, right? So the idea is that these two classic network exploration strategies, breadth first search and depth first search, will give me kind of different view of, of network neighborhood. Right, if I would use the BFS as the exploration strategy, the neighborhood would be like S1, S2, S3. While if I would use the depth first search exploration, the network would, the neighborhood would be S4, 5, and 6. Right, so you, uh, when I would do this in my optimization problem, here I would really try to nail down that this, all these nodes 1, 2, and 3 have to be very close together. While in this particular case, I would more like to capture these longer scale distances because this will be now the, the examples over which the method will um, optimize. So um, how do I now interpolate between this breadth first search and the depth first search? And the way to do this is to define a biased random walk R that is, that has two parameters, right? This biased random walk R will have two parameters and then it will generate me this neighborhood um, N as we had so far. So what are the two parameters? Parameters are P and Q. And uh, parameter P will be um, a return parameter. And the idea will be that as the random walk makes a step, does the random walk want to backtrack a step? So this will be the return parameter. You kind of backtrack one step. And in order to backtrack one step, you need to know where you came from. So this is why this is the second order. You need to remember one step so that you can do the second step. While in the unbiased random walk, you don't remember where you came from. You just do one, you do one more step. So that's kind of the first order. Here you remember where you came from so that you can make a step back. So that's the return. And then we will have another parameter that's called Q that will be in out parameter. And the idea will be, do I want to move 
outwards, more like BFS away from node, uh, node U, or do I want to mo move inwards, kind of stay close to the node U and imitate the breadth for search uh, strategy, right? And this Q in some sense intuitively will be like the ratio between the how much of the breadth for search am I doing versus how much of the depth for search uh, am I doing, okay? That's the intuition. So here is how this looks like if I uh, write it out. The idea is, right, that let's say that the random walk just uh, uh, came uh, from uh, node S1 to node W. So we just traversed uh, this edge, and now at node W we need to decide what do we want to do. And the observation that is important is that when you are at a given node, there's only three things you can do. What are the three things, right? When I say three things, I say three things with respect to where you, uh, to, to your starting node U. And what can you do is navigate back and go a step closer to, to, to you, from where you from where you were. Stay at the same distance. Right here, I'm at distance 2 from you. If I go here, I stay at distance 2. Or make one more step to increase the distance from the starting node. Right? So I essentially have only three options that, that I can do um, with respect to the distance from the starting node. I can decrease the distance, I can stay at the same distance, or I can increase the distance, right? So here I'm two steps, two hops away, I can stay two hops away, I can go to one hop away node, or I can go, up, go to a three hop away node, right? And nothing else I can do. In one, in one step, I can only get plus one, minus one, or I stay at the same distance, okay? So, um, and the idea here, right, is I need to remember where the, where the walk has, um, has come from. So what are we going to do now? We are going to use these parameters P and Q to put transition probabilities on these edges, right? And here is how the transition probabilities would look like if right now we are at node W. If we are at node W, then the idea is the following. Um, if we, we would, uh, the weight of the edge to stay at the same distance from node U um, would have weight one. The, the, the edge to, to make a step back would have the weight of one over P, and then edges that w lead away would have the weight one over Q, okay? And these are now, you can think of this as unnormalized transition probabilities, okay? So um, P is the, para uh, the return parameter. Uh, the smaller the P, the more likely we are to return, and Q is the walk away parameter. Again, the smaller the Q, the farther, the more likely we are to walk away uh, from, the, from the node U, okay? So um, the way you can think of this is to say, oh, I'm at W, these are now edge weights. So, you know, how likely am I to go from W to one of the, uh, to one of the target nodes? Here are unnormalized uh, probabilities, right? So staying at the same distance gets weight one making a step away gets weight one over Q, returning gets a weight um, one over P. This is unnormalized, so I could sum them up, divide them, uh, uh, divide, divide by the sum so that this would sum up to one, and then the, the random walk would flip a coin and the decision would follow according to this uh, probability distribution, okay? And that's, uh, and that's essentially the idea. And the idea is, right, if the value of P is low, then uh, we will always make kind of a step back. So we will be doing more like a breadth first search, right? We make a step and go back, and we make a step and go back, right? If I make Q low, then these this, this weights will be large, and this means that I will want to escape node V as quickly as possible. So I will, will be doing more like a depth first search, okay? And now for the values of P and Q, I will get a different kind of view of the network, okay? So how does this work? Again, first thing is we need to compute this random walk probabilities. Then we will simulate our random walks of length L starting from no each node U. And then we will uh, optimize our objective function from before using stochastic gradient descent to come up with the coordinates, right? Um, and this will, this algorithm also takes linear time because each of these steps um, is linear in the size of the graph, right? 
And just to, to say what's the, what's the idea, what's the difference between this breadth first search and depth first search exploration, right? With breadth first search, you will create these small local uh, neighborhood sets. So when you run optimization for a fixed number of steps, this optimization will really kind of focus on getting these micro level distances correctly, right? And it will really learn who is really a neighbor of whom to a very high degree. And then if you do more like depth for search, you will get more this uh, global picture of the network where you will say what are the nodes that, how are, what are the nodes that are super far away from one another, right? So this will give you more macroscopic view. This will give you more localized microscopic view. And to give you an example how this macro versus micro would look like, this is a very small toy network example. These are, uh, this is a social network of characters interacting with each other in a novel. So this is a novel, a book. Every node is a person in that book. And uh, two, no two, two, two nodes are connected here with a weighted edge, depending on how often they, they interact in this novel. Okay, so you can create graphs out of stories and study the structure of these graphs, right? Um, so here, we are using p equals 1 and q equals uh, 2. So here we get a very microscopic view of the network, right? And you see um, the way that we colored the nodes. I colored the nodes based on uh, whether they are embedded in the same part of the space. And it's kind of interesting because um, the, the method really focuses on identifying local nearby nodes. All these nodes have similar embedding coordinates. Right? And you know, what do you notice is that, for example, yellow are the nodes who are these low degree periphery nodes. And these blue are the nodes that are kind of connecting between red parts of nodes. Right? So by doing this local exploration, we are putting nodes with similar local network structure on top of one another in embedding. Okay? And the reason for this is because the optimization really focuses on these local pockets. And the, 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 the neighborhood never walks this way to say how do these two nodes relate to one another. The, 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 the method only kind of focuses so, so solely on this local graph that it really kind of overlaps these nodes on top of one another to be really able to make these predictions well. While if you run, um, you know, p equals 1 but q.5, so now the walk away parameter um, is more strong and you walk farther out, you get this more microscopic view of the network, right? So now, you know, the red nodes are clustered together in the embedding space, yellow are here, light blue are there, and so on. So now, you essentially try to kind of find almost like communities in this network. And the reason for this effect is that the optimization method kind of focuses on different things. Here it focuses on being able to, to predict nodes at the higher, higher distances, and it's using the expressive power of the embedding space to be able to say where in the network nodes are. While here, when you only explore locally, the, the method never gets asked, is this node a neighbor of that node? So it never uses any representation power to distinguish between these two nodes, but it's kind of using representation power to distinguish red from blue, right? And that's why um, this works this way. Okay, right, great. Um, there is a lot more. This is an extremely hot research area, so there is a lot of uh, research papers that take these uh, this, this fundamental ideas and uh, extend them in many different ways with multiple embeddings, dynamic networks, node attributes, weighted networks, um, directly optimizing one hop and two, two hop random walks, modified versions of the original graph, um, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, this is what I wanted to say, and now I have about five minutes left, so I want to kind of bring this to some conclusion. So the first thing I want to say is I told you about how to compute these coordinates, and I gave you these good stories about how these coordinates are useful, but didn't tell you how to use the coordinates, right? So once you have coordinates, you can do many different things. You can take the coordinates of the node Z and cluster them. And this is what I showed you here. Opa. Right? This is what I showed you here. I created the coordinates and I clustered them, and then I colored the nodes based on the cluster they belong to. And you see that clusterings are very different depending on what the, what's the parameters uh, that I set. Right? So that was 
you know, uh, the top one is when you do when you want to do clustering. The way you do node classification is to say, oh, I will just predict the label of a node given its coordinates. If you want to do link prediction, you would say, I will predict an edge between i and j based on some function of uh, of coordinates of nodes i and coordinate of node j. And one simple way to do this would be to say, oh, I will measure some notion of distance, like for example, the 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 um, the distance between the two embeddings, or I could even say I will try to learn some function g that maybe takes the representation of one node and the representation of another node. Maybe I learn a function g that takes one node, multiplies it coordinate by coordinate with the with the coordinate positions of the other node, and then takes this vector as a prediction function. I could add the two vectors together, make a prediction, or I could take the distance between the two the two points and make a prediction. And again, depending on the particular network and the network structure, um, different choices will give you a uh, different performance. Um, maybe this is all I say. So um, let's maybe um, summarize the following. What should you do and what should you use? No method wins in all cases. Node to vec is generally better for node classification. While, for example, these multi-hop methods, like um, uh, especially like deep walk that goes farther out, are better for link prediction. Um, but uh, random walk, random walk approaches are generally very efficient. Um, and in general, you must choose the definition of node similarity that that matches your application, that kind of matches what is the application you are trying to do. That's the that is the idea. So. What I will do to, to uh, in the last few minutes, I will just tell you about how do you embed not just individual nodes, but entire graphs. Um, so the idea is that you want to maybe classify graphs, right? Given a graph, you want to predict some label for the entire graph. What is this? Um, you can take molecules, represent them as graphs, and now you want to predict what is the property of the molecule. Maybe a molecule can be toxic, toxic or non-toxic or a molecule can, can be cancerogenic or not, right? The idea is I give you the graph of the molecule, predict whether that molecule, um, you know, is, uh, is bad for you or not. You can do this to do graph anomaly detection, where the idea is you would take your graphs, you would embed them, and now you can model the, the structure of the space. And when a new graph comes, and if it gets embedded into a, a weird position in the space, you say this is an anomaly. You can use this to classify social networks, uh, or you can look, for example, you take uh, one of the applications is you take Reddit and you take uh, Reddit comment threads and you represent them as graphs. And now you want to classify something about the, the Reddit comment thread. I don't know, maybe how bad it is, how much people fight, should a moderator come in and, and, and calm people down, and so on and so forth. So how do you do this? What we want to do is we want to take the original network and embed it into the embedding space, the entire graph, not just one node. There are two ideas. The first idea that people have used and surprisingly works, you say the embedding of the graph is simply the sum of the embeddings of the nodes. All right, so I'm just saying I'll take the graph, I'll c c figure out the coordinates of all the nodes, and then I will just sum those coordinates up, and that's the embedding of the graph. This was actually used quite successfully a few years ago to classify molecules based on the graph structure. So that's one way to do this. Uh, a very naive way, but people do this a lot and it works. And then the second idea is that if you say, I want to embed this particular subgraph, then the way you could embed it is to create a super node, like this uh, virtual node up there, and then find the embedding for the virtual node. And the idea is that the virtual node will now cap capture the structure of this subgraph and will give you the embedding of this subgraph, right? So if I would want to embed this entire graph, I would create a virtual node here, connect it to every node of the graph, and then find an embedding for the virtual node. And this way, I can now create uh, the, uh, uh, to, to create uh, embeddings of entire graphs, of particular subgraphs in the graph, by essentially creating these virtual nodes and applying the technology uh, we talked about before. So, um, with this, um, I will I will finish here. Um, I'm happy to take a question if there is one. 
Um, good. If none, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next week we'll talk about large-scale machine learning. So this, how do you take these coordinates and learn models on top of them? <laughs>